I'd like to welcome you all this morning. Thank you so much for joining us for the Foundation Insiders Report, an introduction to the Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation and our over two decades of service to the Blue Ridge Parkway. Our speaker today is CEO Carolyn Ward, the Chief Executive Officer of the Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation, and she knows better than anyone what we've done over the last two decades. So I'm really excited to hear Carolyn's presentation. Again, if you have questions, submit them in the Q&A and we will attempt to answer them during the webinar. Thank you so much, Carolyn. Thank you so much, Jordan. Welcome, everyone. We're going to, for about 25 minutes, give a little bit of an overview of the Blue Ridge Parkway and the role that the foundation plays in trying to help the parkway meet its mission and our mission, and then some examples of projects and programs that we fund and we support that help make the visitor experience better, help protect the resource, and ensure that we'll have it for future generations. So once again, be sure to ask any questions that you have, and thank you again for joining us. So as you know, the Blue Ridge Parkway is more than just a road. It is a, a ribbon of an experience that's laid across the spine of the Blue Ridge. It is a fabulous opportunity that all of us have to experience our history, our culture, remember those family memories, make new memories, but it is more than just a road. It's an economic engine. The Blue Ridge Parkway not, is not just one of the most visited national park units in the country, but it is one of the most economically valuable in the country. For every dollar that's invested in the Blue Ridge Parkway, it returns about $10 to local economies and communities. It generates more jobs than any other park unit in the country. There's about 15,000 jobs that are supported because of the Blue Ridge Parkway. And it brings about $1.1 billion to the local communities that dot the ridges along the sides of the parkway. So if you think about driving the parkway and having a wonderful experience, you have to get off the parkway often to access food, gas, lodging. Although there are some extraordinary places along the parkway, these little mountain towns and communities really help make the parkway experience what it is. It is one of, for the last, I think, about 15 years, we've been either number one or number two in park visitation in the whole 418 units of the National Park System. So we receive more visitors than Yellowstone, Yosemite, and the Grand Canyon combined. It is an extraordinary economic engine for local mountain towns. It brings travelers in. It helps orient them to the experiences that they can have all along the way. It goes through two states. North Carolina and Virginia, it connects Shenandoah National Park to Great Smoky Mountains National Park. 469 miles going through 29 counties. There's a tremendous amount of resource opportunities along the way, overlooks, pullouts, roadside vistas. And unlike many national parks, it's sort of one big blob. The Blue Ridge Parkway, because it's like a string of pearls along the ridges of the Blue Ridge, we have about 4,700 adjacent neighbors. Most national parks have just a few adjacent landowners that surround the park. But in this case, the land is often owned by other individuals, whether it's a personal individual or forest service land, state park. And because of that, and you think about the fact that most of the visitors, about 89% of the visitors that come to the Blue Ridge Parkway come for the vistas. They come for those beautiful scenic views they get. And those scenic views are owned often by other people. And so being a good neighbor is one of the components that makes the parkway such an amazing experience. And we'll talk a little bit more about how important that is in a minute. So it's not just that ribbon of road. It's not just an economic engine for our mountain towns and communities. It's a haven for biodiversity. The Blue Ridge Mountains are one of the most biodiverse places in the temperate world. There are more species of trees out here in these mountains than there are in all of Europe. We have an enormous amount of diversity and it's because the, we're at sort of the southernmost range of northern species and we're at the northernmost range of southern species. Then you have the variation in elevation and all of those things combined make for an enormously rich biodiverse place. 
not just an economic engine, not just a haven for biodiversity, but it is a warehouse for the stories of our past. It is a living museum of culture and history. There are many different cultural landscapes as you drive through Virginia and you see the agricultural fields that roll across or you see the various archeological sites. It's not just a little mountain cabin, but it's places like the Moses Cone Estate from a Jewish immigrant that settled in the mountains of Western North Carolina. There's 14 visitor centers. There's over 90 historic buildings. There is a tremendous amount of stories that are found along the trails on the Blue Ridge that represent many different diverse cultures and, and histories. So you've got all of these resources. You have a free experience, unlike many national parks, the Blue Ridge Parkway is free. You combine all of those visitors that are coming into this resource and a budget that's been flat for about 20 years. So the operation budget of the Blue Ridge Parkway is about $16 million. That's about a dollar per visitor that comes to the park. Well, that amount of money over 20 years has been sort of consistent but the costs of operation have gone up. So if you think about the last 20 years, the cost of gas or the cost of paint to paint your home or whatever it is you wanna think about, those costs have gone up over time, but the operational budget of the parkway has stayed fairly consistent. And that has resulted in a large gap between what the parkway receives for operation and what it actually needs to be able to operate. So all of those things have resulted in shuttered facilities, road, we've got about half of the Blue Ridge Parkway's motor road is over 20 years old in terms of when it's been paved the last time. So any of you that have been out on the parkway, you've seen these closed amenities, you've seen potholes in the road, picnic tables that are degraded, and all of that has accumulated in about $500 million of backlog needs things that are just sort of piling up because the annual operating budget can just barely take care of the annual operation. It really can't address some of those backlog cyclical needs. That's why the Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation was created. In 1997, we started as, an, as a way to try to help bridge that gap in funding, to bring a community of people together that love the parkway, that want to help make a difference, that know that it needs our help and to help try to address that gap in funding by looking at different projects and programs that the parkway otherwise cannot afford to fund. We try to help do that working closely with parkway staff to address some of the main essential needs. So we do that in several ways. We fund projects and programs in four basic categories because we know that there's a lot of need on the parkway and with $500 million of backlog needs, we obviously can't fix everything at once. And so we work closely with Parkway staff, with our donors and our communities along the way to try to help prioritize those projects and programs. And we also wanna make sure that we're funding things in different categories. Not everybody might care about the historical building. Maybe they love educational programs more. So we try to make sure that we're funding things in categories that help address a variety of needs. One of the first things that we do is funding cultural and historic preservation and protection. As we talked about earlier, there is an enormous amount of buildings and infrastructure that warehouse these histories and these cultures, and we wanna to try to help preserve those. This is an example of one of the projects we've been funding for several years at Mabry Mill the mill wheel had stopped turning and we helped repoint, redo the entire wheel. This last year, we helped fund the rebuilding of the flume that carries the water to the mill wheel. There is no lack of work that even at this one site needs to be done. Another example of a project that we've spent a lot of effort and energy on because our donors and our community members value it so much and because it's such an important place along the parkway is work at the, Blue, at the Moses H. Cone Estate. This is a very large estate. It's one of the most popular destinations on the parkway. It has 26 miles of carriage roads, one of the best carriage systems in the entire country that represent that kind of an experience, the ones at Acadia National Park 
are of the same caliber of these. It has uh, orchards and ponds and a tremendous amount of resources on the landscape, not to mention the manor house. The Moses Cone Manor House built in the early 1800s, as any wooden structure in the high country knows, has fallen into some sort of disrepair. It takes a lot of work to keep an old wooden structure up. And again, because of that deferred maintenance and that lack of funding, the foundation has stepped in to try to help address some of these needs. We've done some work already in thinking about replacing the flat roof and the balusters. We've done a lot of work along the estate itself, and we'll talk a little bit more about some of that in just a moment. Some other cultural resource preservation and protection projects deal with closed facilities. There's several facilities along the parkway that hold near and dear memories in everyone's heart. And one of those is the Bluff Restaurant and Coffee Shop. It was closed in 2010 and since 2010 fell into disrepair. This was it at its heyday a wonderful restaurant. It was the first one to open along the Blue Ridge Parkway in the 40s. It was the first facility to serve food. It is a fa fabulous building and certainly holds, I think this is one of the main phone calls we get from donors and supporters about how much they love the coffee shop and the memories they had there with their granddad and their desire to take their grandchildren. And when it shuttered in 2010, unfortunately, black mold uh, came into the building it became a dangerous situation. And so we began working with the local communities and our supporters in about 2016 to start generating funds to try to bring this thing back to life. And since that time, we've been doing considerable work. The restaurant is actually slated to open in the next couple of weeks. This is a work crew that came in to help rebuild the entire counter. They have gone through painstaking work and you can see this original picture. You can see those lights hanging there. Well, we had those lights completely restored, and now they are once again hanging in their original locations. This is a current picture that was just taken last week. We are getting very close to being able to reopen this restaurant. It's very exciting, and all of that is because of the support of our donors and our community members who invest in and want to see these significant places brought back. This is the entry coming into the building. And again, we're very close, so you should be hearing some more information about that very soon. So a second category of projects that we fund, think about visitor enjoyment and safety. Accessing some of these places in a safe way is a critical thing. Many of the trails become degraded over time. Many of the opportunities for some of our older visitors or visitors that might have mobility issues, we want to try to make sure we create an experience that everyone can enjoy. And although driving and sightseeing along the parkway is still the number one uh, preferred way to experience it, number two is hiking. And so trying to bring those resources back in such a way that less visitors of all types get out there and enjoy the resource is important. And so we've invested in a lot of projects that do that. And also you wanna sit down and just have a nice little picnic. But unfortunately, many of the historic picnic tables found along the parkway are in this kind of shape. And again, it was built in the 40s. And so over time, you have to go back and replace resources. You have to go back and upgrade facilities. So some of the projects we've done deal with trail accessibility and erosion and damage that happens to the resource because of use and just because of the nature of a trail out in a park over time. It erodes when the rain runs down through it and you don't continue to go back and upkeep it. So there's some trail work you can see that we've done up at Craggy Gardens. The trail had been severely eroded. People were walking around the eroded parts of the trail and forming a new trail, which was causing additional resource damage. So we worked with the park to hire an ACE crew, working with the Park Service, an American Conservation Experience crew that went up and did some trail work to try to help make this a safer, more enjoyable visitor experience. As I said before, the number one way to experience the parkway is driving and sightseeing. But over time, those vistas become covered up, the trees grow. 
Uh, and so if you're not continually going back and clearing off some of those vistas, eventually you sort of driving through a green tunnel. And so one of the projects that we've been working on for several years is to help reopen some of those historic vistas along the parkway. This is an ongoing project that will continue in the future. We help sponsor their AIR. It's the Arborist Incident Response Team. So we help fund that trailer that houses all their equipment so they can get up there either when there's a storm and a lot of damage and they need to go clear the motor road or when they wanna go open up a vista and this is an example of just one of the vistas that we've helped to bring back to its original glory. And it is quite a sight to watch them go up and the landscape architect very carefully selects which trees to bring down in order to open back up the historic vista without damaging any of the resource. They try to make sure that the birds aren't nesting. So it's a very meticulous project that they go to great efforts to ensure both protection of resource and bringing the resource back to its original design. Now, when you're traveling along the parkway, one of the things that makes the visitor experience more enjoyable, if you're camping especially, is a shower. And one of the only shower facilities located along the parkway is the one that we help fund and build at Price Lake Campground. This is a brand new facility, again, trying to upgrade facilities uh, when you build a campground in the 40s, putting showers in wasn't exactly the number one thing everybody thought about. A uh, little, little different now, if you're traveling the parkway for 469 miles, I, I really do want you to have a shower occasionally. So this is the first one that we built. We hope we'll be able to do more. And again, this was at Price Lake Campground. Another visitor uh, experience project we've done to make it safer, more enjoyable was up at Price Lake. I mean, up at uh, Abbott Lake at Peaks of Otter, and we helped fund one of the first fully ADA accessible trails. This is a paved trail that goes around the perimeter of the lake. There's a, a dock that goes out that's also accessible, making it so that folks of all different mobilities can go out there and experience the resource. So in addition to cultural resource protection projects, projects that make the visitor experience better. We also fund natural resource protection projects. That biodiverse resource out there needs continued care to ensure that we're protecting that resource in the best way possible. So several of the projects that we have done over the years help protect the resource that the visitors experience and the resource that the wildlife uh, needs to be able to have out there as well. So if you've spent any time in the Blue Ridge, you've seen the degradation of the hemlock trees over time. It's a terrible thing that's happening. Um, unlike the chestnut trees, once the hemlock tree is lost from this resource, there's not really a, a, a replacement tree that can come in and fill the same niche. When the chestnut trees were lost, the oak trees could come in and fill that ecological niche. But the hemlock trees are the only species that's evergreen that shades a lot of those creeks and rivers and water systems along the parkway, which keeps the water temperature down, which makes for great habitat for trout and other species that rely on those cool temperatures. Well, the hemlocks, uh, when the woolly adelgid was introduced, uh, are degrade. I think the last number I saw said 80% of the trees of the hemlocks are infected and we may lose them. So one of the projects that we worked on funding was to write some grants and get some support to try to treat some of the remaining stands of hemlocks that are still salvageable and can be saved. This is a bog turtle. This was one of my favorite projects. This little turtle lives in bogs found along the parkway. And it's really unique and special. It's only found in that kind of an environment. And unfortunately, there's a lot of people that will go out and poach this little turtle because he can be sold on the black market. So we funded a project that put turtle trackers on these little turtles to see where their migration was, see where they were moving so that we could then reinforce the protection of the species. Going out on re in the resource, this is at Moses Cone, and making sure that we are clearing the carriage trails, that we're taking out the vegetation to make the visitor experience safer, but also in protecting the resource itself. So this is a project that sort of crosses many of those categories that we fund. The fourth category of projects we fund and work on are education and outreach. 
thinking about that next generation of stewards, thinking about the folks that are going to come after us that are going to take care of this place. So we find a lot of programs that get people out into the resource, that experience the resource firsthand, learn close up about the resources and how to protect them. We funded citizen science projects and programs, things that get people out hands on into the resource. We've done signage and interpretive projects with the park. This was uh, an interpretive project we did at Graveyard Fields, also in partnership with the Forest Service, one of those adjacent landowners, working to put some signage out to educate visitors to keep them safe and help protect the resource. So in addition to funding projects and programs in partnership with the park, we also operate critical programs, and two of the programs we operate, I'll give a brief overview, is the Blue Ridge Music Center and the Kids in Parks program. The Blue Ridge Music Center is located at milepost 213 on the Blue Ridge Parkway, and this place was put aside specifically to protect and preserve and present the legacy of heritage music, mountain music. And so we put on a concert series in the summer and during the summer season, we have Midday Mountain Music, which provides free music seven days a week for the traveling public that comes through. It is quite an amazing opportunity to both help present the legacy of mountain music to people and continue its tradition with the concerts on the music stage. So this was Nikki from the Steep Canyon Rangers. We have a wide variety of shows showcasing all of the roots of heritage music that are found along these mountains. There's dancing, there's workshops that happen, there's big and little concerts. And this was a concert with Old Crow Medicine Show that we did a couple years ago. In addition to the Blue Ridge Music Center, the other program that we run is called Kids in Park. We started this one because we realized that only 7 to 11 percent of visitors that come to the parkway bring children, 7 to 11 percent. And at that rate, we might not have a future generation of stewards that are going to help take care of the parkway when we're gone. So we started a program to try to get kids unplugged and outside. And now we have hiking trails, disc golf trails, biking trails, paddling pediatrician trails. We have over 600 doctors writing prescriptions for kids to go out in nature. Because the program was so popular and because we know that people travel, right, when you're born in one place, you often end up in another place. So getting kids everywhere out and connected to our parks and public lands is important. So the Kids in Parks program, although it started along the parkway, has spread across the entire state of North Carolina and across the country. We have about 211 trails across 12 states and Washington, D.C. There's actually a Kids in Parks track trail around the White House. In the world of COVID now, we have actually introduced a new e-adventure program that you can do through the kidsinparks.com website. So you can go on an outdoor adventure anywhere by downloading experiences on your phone and the kids register those experiences on our website and they receive prizes. So in terms of our outcomes for this program, about 1.5 million adventures have been held on our Kids in Parks track trails and in, that impacts their health in a positive way and the health of our parks is also impacted in a positive way. About 54% of the kids and families that come to a Kids in Parks track trail were first time visitors to the park. So we're bringing a new generation of stewards in. And in fact, 11% of them had never even been hiking before. So we're trying to get that next generation of stewards connected to our public lands. So the foundation does all this because of you. And we do it because we're out in the community. You invite us to speak at your Rotary. We have events where people come and are introduced to the work we do at the foundation. You attend a webinar like this one. We have a specialty license plate that we sell in the state of North Carolina. It's the most popular plate in the state. We have about 27,000 little billboards driving around the state. And that generates a lot of resources for us to be able to do these projects and programs across the state. We also have donor boards that are located in several locations along the park that helps display and promote the work that we do and encourages others to try to give. 
we apply for a lot of grants, and so often folks will call us up and let us know about grant opportunities, like that hemlock grant that we received to help protect the trees. We also have a program we just introduced last year called the Trails and Views Forever Program. This is a program that's gonna help us address picnic work, campground work, education outreach work, almost everything except the historic building, so it's visitor experience based. And so this has been a very successful program. We had a $300,000 challenge match that we just recently met, thanks to an anonymous donor and all of the support from our community. So this is gonna be a program that's gonna help us keep those vistas open and the picnic areas and things accessible. And mainly we do it by forming friendships and partnerships. It takes all of us, we are a community of stewards that care about our park and our public land. So thank you all so much for joining us. And I think we have just a couple minutes for questions. Thank you, Carolyn, that was wonderful. Um, the, most of the questions that popped up were about openings along the parkway. And um, all of that information, we are trying to keep updated on our social media and we are trying to support the park as much as possible as we all go through this current situation. Um, so most of that information should be up to date. At this point, most restrooms are open and we are working to support the park to reopen facilities as quickly as possible. Um, the other questions that came up were about the bluffs and when will it be opening? Uh, Carolyn, we, we know it'll hopefully open very soon in the next few weeks. Yeah, we think we're we're waiting. We've got like if you can still hear me. A couple inspections that need to be completed, and we need to make sure we're going to get through those okay. So we don't want to make an announcement quite yet, but we think it's going to be within the next two weeks. And as soon as we go over those couple hurdles that are still left, we will put that information out far and wide. Sure. Um, the, another question was about the status of Cone Manor. Um, we did uh, have a webinar on that recently, which you can find that recording on our YouTube channel. Uh, we are in the process of finalizing the construction plans for Cone Manor, and this will be forthcoming as well, correct, Carolyn? Yeah, we just received some information this morning about some of the final paperwork that's being done by the contractor that's going to be doing that work. And we do expect work to ha start happening in the next few weeks. And so there will be lots of work underway this fall. How much they get done and how far they get in that scope of work will be dependent upon the weather in Blowing Rock. <laughs> sure. And my friend Bill Stone asked about copies of the slides. We will have this webinar on our YouTube channel. We will be emailing it out. And um, Carolyn or I are happy to email that to you as well if you'd like a copy of the PowerPoint, Bill. So we're so appreciative of everyone joining us this morning. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>